welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. And we are in a capital stewardship campaign. Now you've received a brochure and we're going to be talking about this. So this is a, a season that we're at at the Rock Church, a very interesting and dynamic and supernatural season. Let me explain. We, 10 years ago, moved into this building. And this church raised $5 million. And we were much smaller than we are now. And we were building the church. And so here we are 10 years later, and the Lord put it in my son's hearts and my husband's hearts that we need to do something and push in as we break 25 years to push in supernaturally into the kingdom and to pay this church off. God instructed us that we need to get free and clear. We need to get out of debt, that the borrower is slave to the lender. And in this time of difficulty and resource and people have lost their homes and we all know what's happened and we've all could probably testify of God's miracle working power, but also of some loss, but he keeps us. We know that that God is, is putting into our hearts and our spirits as leaders here that we need to take seriously the warning of the Lord and to get free and clear. And that in doing that, three things are going to happen. Number one, freedom for the future, which is what we have here as our campaign slogan. We will be free from the bondage of an institution. No one will take this building from the next generation. No one, no one, no one. Not, it won't become a mosque. It won't become something that it wasn't designed to be. You can go on the Redlands campus of, of the University of Redlands, and it was, it was built by Christians. It was a Christian university. That's why there's scripture all over there, but now it's a secular university. This is holy ground. This will stay holy ground in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God's a God of multi-generations, and he's called us to, number two, give our next generation children, our, my children and my grandchildren and your children and your grandchildren, a gift, a gift of faith and sacrifice that says we believe in you and we want to help you go further, faster than we did. We were the tip of the arrow of this thing. We laid the foundation, but God's got this next generation now, and they're going further, and they're going faster, and God wants us to equip them. The sons don't lay up for the fathers. The fathers lay up for the sons, and God says, pay this church off and give this over to the next generation and watch them run with the gospel to and fro because number three, the third thing that God says we'll have freedom for is it will release all that interest debt that we are paying every month into ministries. Iglesia La Roca is growing. We can build a new sanctuary at the other end of this church. What a testimony that is when Hispanic and English can come together and be one tribe under one church, one nation, honoring and loving each other. And from, from the Spanish-speaking service, I'd love to see a Cambodian service. And every language that's in this valley, I'd love to see the gospel preached in their mother tongue. Because God's a God of tribes and generations. He's a God of every culture. We are one tribe. We are one race. We are one generation in him. There is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, bond or free, but we are all one one in Christ Jesus. We are of the kingdom of God of the tribe of Judah, a new creation. And so God has so much planned for this congregation. So here we are, and we're bringing this to you. And, and I have to admit to you that, that when they came to me with this, when my son and my husband, my sons and my husband came to me, and I, I said, I know we need to do this. I know this is God. There was in my heart a dread because I don't like to ask people for anything. I suppose it's pride. But it's also a bit of, um, I want you to like us. I want you to like me. I don't want you to think I'm after your money. And so there's that part of me that is so wrong. And I repent before the Lord and I repent before you because I'm wrong. Because here, I'll tell you why. Because God's not after your money and he's not after me to get your money. He's after our hearts. He is after our hearts. And as I have been studying and listening to my husband and listening to others, God's been telling me and teaching me things. And I know that if we don't teach stewardship to this church, that I am doing you as much of a disservice if I don't teach you about salvation, holiness, sanctification, healing, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and all the other great doctrines of the church that Jesus has given unto us. And so I have been wrong. I want to read you a quote from J.L. Kraft, head of the Kraft Cheese Corporation. You guys ever eat macaroni and cheese? Y'all know what Kraft is, right? 
Jail Kraft, head of the Kraft Cheese Corporation, who had given approximately 25% of his enormous income to Christian causes for many years, said, the only investments I've ever made which have paid constantly increasing dividends is the money I've given to the Lord. Pastors will do their greatest service in leading their men and women to understand the truth of God concerning the stewardship of time and money. John D. Rockefeller explained a great principle when he said, I never would have been able to tithe the first million if I, I never would have been able to tithe the first million dollars I ever made if I had not tithed my first salary, which was $1.50 a week. Listen, God has an economic recovery plan for us, just like he has salvation, just like he washes our minds and our hearts, just like he restores our souls and our bodies. It is the will of God for us to prosper. It is the will of God for him to prosper our hands. The first commandment he ever gave to man in the Garden of Eden he put man in a garden. He didn't put man in a dump. He gave man a job, tend the garden, have dominion. So work is not something bad. Work is God-given, and it's wonderful. Work is good for us, and God made us and put us to be fruitful. This is what he said to Adam and Eve. Be fruitful, multiply, subdue, and have dominion of the earth. Rule this planet as my underlords, as I rule heaven, sons and daughters of God. We know that when Adam sold out and Eve sold out to temptation and sin, that this planet, the title deed was handed over to Satan, and now there are two kingdoms operating. There's the kingdom of darkness, which Jesus clearly identified Satan as the God of this world, the kingdom of darkness. And there is the kingdom of God, which Jesus said, and Jim has been teaching us about over here. He said in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So we see two kingdoms, two systems operating, darkness and light. We're going to find out today that if we don't understand this kingdom and this economic system will be operating over in this one, and it's mammon, and it will be our God, and God wants to free us from that. So number four reason for freedom for the future is God wants to set this congregation free from the spirit of mammon and bring us into the kingdom of God's economic recovery program, and it starts by giving and receiving. And we're going to find out. Will you stand with me as we pray? Father, as I come into your presence now, as we open the word of God, I ask in the name of Jesus for an anointing to teach. I have a very brief time, Father, so I ask that you'd help me be a few words, but they would be wisely spoken. I ask Almighty God that you would free this congregation, free us from anything that would keep us from entrance and from successfully living in your kingdom and operating and functioning as you want us to function, that we would be an open-hearted, open-handed church, that you could get resources to us and resources through us miraculously so that your plans and your purposes could be done. I mark this day, Father. I mark it in the name of Jesus, this Mother's Day, that, God, you would do a sovereign work in the heart of all of us, that we would have a spirit of generosity and faith in this church, that we would fear nothing but you, and I ask that you open our eyes and open our hearts as we open your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 12. We're going to be looking this morning as we go into this fourth session of our capital stewardship campaign, Freedom for the Future. We're going to be looking at a woman because it's Mother's Day and it's called the widow and the widow's might. How many of you heard about the widow's might and you know the story? Let me see your hands. Heard the story of the widow's might. Matthew chapter 12. This widow... He's going to teach us some lessons on this Mother's Day. So if you don't have your Bibles, you can see on the screen. But if you do, we're in Mark chapter 12. Just briefly, history, quick history. Jesus is in his last year of ministry. He's in Jerusalem. He's teaching. He's about to go to the cross. You'll find this story in Luke chapter 21, and you'll find it in Mark chapter 12. He's talking in the teaching in the temple. Every day he's going to the temple to teach. The scribes and the Pharisees are looking for a way to take him out. They want to destroy him. He's very close to the cross, and he is in the temple, and he's teaching. 
And this is what he says in Luke chapter 12, and I'm going to go to verses 38. I'm going to just read it quickly, even though it's not on the overheads. Then he said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats of the synagogues, and the best places at the feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive a greater condemnation. So here he just blasts the scribes and the Pharisees, the very ones that are, are teaching, that are listening to him, the elders and the leaders. Israel had become so religious, they'd come so locked under the law, that all they could do is just the do's and the don'ts of religion. And that's what religion does, is it locks us up into do's and don'ts. You have to do this and you have to do that. See, in the kingdom of God, you don't have to do anything. It's from your heart. We don't have to. We get to. There's a huge mind change and a huge difference. And so these, these leaders loved money, and they loved the widow's offerings, and they loved to devour widow's homes. And so people will read this and say that that's how the church is. It just wants to devour your finances. It just wants to steal from you. All that pastor talks about is money, money, money. Again, I say unto you, they're wrong, and so was I. Because it's not about money, it's about our hearts. It's about a kingdom, it's about a system, it's about an economic system of heaven, supernatural. You can be natural or you can be supernatural. In the old kingdom, the kingdom that we are in but not of, I am in this world now as a believer but not of it. In this world but not of it, there is a system and it's ruled by mammon and it's buying and selling. Are you with me? That's why pastor's been teaching us that you can't have two masters because you're going to love one and hate the other. You can't serve God and mammon. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money itself isn't evil. Money is just a servant. That's all it is. And over here in the kingdom of God, the system that God operates in is agape love, selflessness, your needs at my expense. It's, it's keyed in by generosity and it's moved by faith. Faith, faith moves the invisible into the visible, and it's moved and it operates in giving and receiving. Giving and receiving, dark kingdom, it's operated by selfishness, Satan's kingdom, my needs at your expense, buying and selling. That's why there's greed, that's why there's lying, that's why Wall Street goes off, that's why the banks go off, that's why there is trickery, there's deception, there's stealing, there's robbery. This kingdom has fallen, this kingdom has a lot of heartache and a lot of sorrow. And those that desire to be rich in this kingdom are going to absolutely mark themselves for destruction. But this kingdom, operating in the love of God and the generosity of God, God so loved the world that he gave, this system works at your needs, my expense. Generosity, giving and receiving. This kingdom has an economic system that works completely different. Fear not, little flock. It's a father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is supernatural. The kingdom of heaven takes five loaves and two fish and multiplies it to feed 5,000 men plus women and children. The kingdom of heaven, the riches of heaven, come in and a withered hand becomes whole. No doctor's bill. The kingdom of heaven comes in and where you can't, he can where what was impossible with man is now possible with God. Where it was possible in this system not to do that, where you had to lie and cheat and steal and work in that system. You come over here and you walk in integrity. You walk in the ways of God. You walk in generosity and sacrifice and faith. And guess what? What couldn't happen over there will happen here. But we got to get over into this kingdom. So God's not after our money. He's after our hearts. Now the money becomes his servant and our servant. It's a totally different system. So he's looking at these scribes and Pharisees, and he's blasting them. He's nailing them because religion has absolutely destroyed any concept of what Jesus was here to do. They missed the day of their visitation. So here's this widow. She comes in, and she, and let's read it now in verse 41. Now, Jesus sat opposite the treasury. Right after he said that, he sits opposite the treasury. He sees how the people put the money into the treasury. So he's watching now after he said this. He's watching now how they give. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrant. And he said to his disciples, he called his disciples. So just get the picture. He's just sitting there. He's just, he's just taught. He's just said that. He's just sitting down. There were seven offering 
containers in the temple. They look like trumpets. And he's just watching as the people make their progression in the woman's court, just putting the money in, putting the money in. Rich are putting lots of money in. Lots, and Jesus is just sitting there. God's just sitting there watching how we give. Because listen, how we give is tied to our hearts. Money's tied to our hearts. And all of a sudden, here comes a widow. She puts in two mites. Two mites was the value of, in today's vernacular, would be about $1.25. Value was a, a quadrant, which means that it was 1 64th of a day's wage. A day's wage, if, she were, if you were a low income, if you were, what is it, minimum wage earner, which she probably was widow. She had no, she had no job, probably had no education. Doesn't tell us much about her, just that she was poor. She was as poor as you can get. So let's say she, if she could work, which she didn't have a job, if she could, she'd have nothing more than minimum wage. So that'd be about 80 bucks a day. So 164th of that would be about $1.25. So she put about $1.25 into the offering. Jesus is watching the rich put in a whole lot of money. Then one poor widow came and she threw in $1.25. And he called his disciples to himself, and he said, Assuredly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. They put in out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. So this widow has something to teach me today on Mother's Day. I want to just give you two quick things. There's two kingdoms. God's translated me in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. He's translated me out of the kingdom of darkness, and he's brought me into the kingdom of his dear son. That's the truth. You got born again. You're out of this kingdom. You're now into this one, the kingdom of God. But if you don't know how it works... You'll operate in the old kingdom, and you're bound by the natural laws of that kingdom. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God wants to set us free from the spirit of mammon. It doesn't need to rule us, and we don't need to be afraid of money, and money shouldn't tell us where we're going, what we're doing, how we're going to give, and where we're going to live, and what our kids are going to be. Mammon is a god it's demonic. It's from a fallen system. And I am born of the spirit of the living God. He has taken me into the kingdom of his dear son. There is no limit. It is limitless what God has available for those that love him. He, he has pleasure in the prosperity of his people. John chapter 3 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Until we understand a couple of things, we're never going to get this. Number one, God loves us and God doesn't want us broke and poor and walking around with nothing in our pockets. He doesn't want us so poor that we can't do anything. That is not who God is. Poverty is not of God. It is of the spirit of the devil, and it is hell on earth. I have been to nations that are dirt poor. I've been in the dumps of the Philippines. I've been to many nations in Africa. I've seen what poverty does. It is not the spirit of God, and it is not from God. It is from Satan himself. It is not the will of God that you and I be so poor that we can't meet the needs of our family and meet the needs of others. That's a lie from the pit of hell. But if we're in this old kingdom and we're bound by the spirit of mammon and we're afraid of money and it rules us, we'll never understand the freedom that is given us. And this widow teaches me some things about this kingdom. God uses a dirt poor woman to teach me about sacrifice and faith. She understood she was a steward. And until you and I understand the two kingdoms and that we're stewards, this doesn't belong to us. Nothing I have belongs to me. It all belongs to God. I'm not taking anything with me. I'm here. I manage it, but I don't get to take it with me. Thank God I don't have to take it with me. So that means I'm a steward. So what does that mean? If God owns everything, if God owns everything, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. If he owns everything, the real basic question here, folks, is listen to this. It's not how much of our money we should give to God, but how much of God's money should we keep for ourselves? 
the basic question is not how much of our money should we give to God, but how much of God's money should we keep for ourselves? But you see, when you understand that God wants us to prosper, and he's not trying to keep us broken poor, but he wants to free us from the love of money and from the spirit of mammon. And his system operates in generosity and selflessness and love. And when I release what I have and give it to him, then he can release what he has and give it to me and through me. It's a whole different system. She teaches me two things. Number one, she teaches me sacrifice. These gave a lot of money. These rich men gave a lot of money to the temple. Jesus is watching it. Jesus watches my checkbook and he watches how I give. The value of the sacrifice in my heart determines the value of the gift that I give God. Now, the tithe ought to be where we begin. We're not under the law. The tithe is like training wheels on a bike. We should start with the tithe. That teaches us how to release and to give ourselves over in faith to the one that has our eternity. If I can't trust him with my eternity, what, I can't trust him with my every day? So 90% of my money, when I give him 10% of it, 90% of it he gives back to me. He blesses it. But now there's offerings. And offerings go into sacrifice. Offerings, she gave all she had. They gave out of their abundance. They weren't going to miss it. It didn't mean anything to them. I've got this extra. I'll give it to God. But you see, she gave everything she had. And that impressed the heart of God. God stopped everything and said, come here, boys. I'm going to teach you. This is a show and tell time. This is a teaching time. Disciples, you're going to be the apostles. This is what I'm looking for. This woman doesn't have much, a dollar twenty-five. What, she can get a couple of Del Tacos? That's all she's got. But that's all she's got. She's going home to nothing. She's going home to an empty refrigerator. She's going home to no bank account. She's going home to no food. All she's got is a buck twenty-five. Now, that can't get her much. So she is bringing everything she has. That's called sacrifice. It's costing her everything to trust God. God pays attention to the sacrifice of my heart. And number two, she teaches me faith. You see, you can't sacrifice without faith. Or it becomes a works program. And you give grudgingly. And God says, I love a cheerful giver whose heart is in their giving. Again, God, how do I get my heart in my giving? Well, if I live in this kingdom, the fallen kingdom of this world, buying and selling where there's weeds, thorns, and thistles, where I'm under the system of the natural... Where I have to, I ha I'm in it, but I'm not of it. But if I go over here and I say, nuts to that system, I'm going to live in this system. God, I don't understand it yet, but I'm learning about it. And I'm understanding that, Lord, when I give and I open my hand, God, and I give in faith, now I'm believing you to give back to me what I'm going to need. You see, God isn't asking us to sell everything and walk around naked and hungry and poor. He is asking us to sacrifice and to release what's in our hand so he can give us what's in his hand. It's a big difference. It's like the little girl that had the pop bead necklace. She was six years old, and she had these pop beads, and she loved them. She wore them to bed every night. They were little pop bead pearls. They were her favorite thing. Every night she'd wear them to bed, and her daddy came and prayed with her every night. He'd say, honey, would you give me those pop beads? I love you so much. Do you love me enough to give you those pop beads? She said, no, daddy, you don't need those. They're mine. I love them, daddy. She didn't know that her daddy had bought her pearls. He had them in his pocket. He had him ready to give her every night if she'd just give him her pop beads, her plastic beads. But she didn't trust her daddy. She didn't know that her daddy had the real thing to give her. Night after night, he'd ask her for those pop beads. Night after night, she'd say, no, daddy, they're mine. Why would you want them? Finally, one night, she said, oh, daddy, I love you so much. I love you more than these silly pop beads. Daddy, if you want them, if you really want them, here, daddy, I'm going to take them off. I'm going to give them to you. When she opened her hand and she gave those pot beads to her daddy, her daddy pulled out of his pocket. He said, I've been waiting for this. He said, child, I know you love these pearls. They're not real. So I bought you real pearls. Here, let me put them around your neck. You see, that's how our father is. We hold on to the dust of this earth like it's everything. And God's just waiting for me to just release the dust so he can give me the true riches, what really belong to me. It's called faith. It's called faith. It's called Faith Church. Pastor Jim, come on up. I'm about finished. Freedom for the future. God wants his church free out of debt. 
Maybe we're all personally not out of debt yet. Let's get this church out of debt. Watch God watch us get out of debt as we begin to get out of this kingdom, get into this one. God wants us to sacrifice for the next generation because this is a generational church. As it's multicultural, it is multi-generational. The Lord tarries, I'm going to be in heaven looking down. If God lets me look through the window, I don't know. There's a great cloud of witnesses. Maybe I'm going to get to join them. I'm going to be cheering you on and, and cheering you on and cheering you on as you win souls for the kingdom of God until the Lord returns. Freedom for the next generation. Number three, freedom for ministries. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. What can we do when we are free from debt? And this church begins to understand the kingdom of concept of tithing and giving. It's giving and receiving. In giving, we have freely, freely received. God says, freely you've received, freely give. Church, he wants to free us from the spirit of mammon and the fear of money. He wants us like that little girl to take off the necklace, give it to dad. And let him give us the true riches of what he's been waiting. But he needs an open heart, sacrificial, and a heart full of faith. So as we open our hands and our heart, he can put in what he's been waiting to give us. The miraculous, supernatural kingdom of heaven. So good. It's really all about the freedom of the heart. What would it be like for you and I to live our lives not concerned about money every day? Not concerned about what we can do, where we can go, what we can have, what we don't have. That just knowing assuredly without a shadow of a doubt that God is there and he's going to meet our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The freedom here is not just for the church. The freedom here is for you. And that's what we're really talking about more than anything else is the freedom for you so that you can live life to the fullest that God has waiting for you. A lot of people have asked me, Pastor, how is this going to work? Let's just go over it for a bit. I want to show you on the overhead, if I may, if you look at the screens, these are commitment cards. You may have gotten one already today, but if you didn't, there's one probably in the somewhere in the aisle, or you can get one on the way out. We're not collecting those this week. It's really next week, but I thought I'd explain it to you this week so that you can understand how it works. Listen closely. You see the little tag, you can tear it off, it's on the other side. It's actually a really neat little thing. It reminds you of what your pledge is. And you can also get a little, if you will, magnet that you can put it on your refrigerator with that underneath it that holds it in place that reminds you. And also then you can talk to God and remind God, God, I need to do this. I need to fulfill this. Upon the other side that comes back to the church, if you see the gray portion up there, it says commitment card. You put your name, address, telephone number, email address if you have one. And then it says your total commitment. It's a three-year commitment. We're not asking you to bring it all in now. We're not asking you next week when you bring your commitment card to bring it in. What we're asking you to do is to have that sacrificial relationship with God. It's always in the stretch that God's eyes open and sees something. When you're stretched beyond that which you think you can do, that's what catches the heart of God. And so you would write in there a three-year commitment. And then you see the next part where it says, I, I, I will fulfill my commitment monthly or quarterly or annually. My commitment, I don't have any idea how I'm going to fulfill it. I'm just leaving that blank. I really don't give a flip if the office knows how they're going to get it. All I know is they're going to get it in three years. And I'm believing God for that. There's no way I can break this down, what I'm giving on a weekly or monthly or annual, semi-annual basis. I cannot fill that part in. So I'm not asking you to either. If you'd like to, fine. If you'd like to make a calculated guess on how you're going to fulfill that commitment, that's great. Go ahead and fill that. But for me personally, I, I'm, I'm out there on the limb. I'm 68 years old. I've got two jobs. One of them is going to do and fulfill my, my, my commitment. And so I don't know how it's going to come in, but it's going to come in. Then you see the bottom part where it says signature. And it says, this is not a binding agreement. I'm not going to take you to court over this and call you names or anything. This is just something that you're saying. We want to make sure it's you that does it and not your next-door neighbor who's pledging for you. That's all. 
And yet also when you put your name on something, that's very important. Listen, guys, this is about really your heart. But let's talk about it just for a moment. A lot of times people don't realize how easy it is for us to fulfill. You know, the goal, if you look at the first word on the word believe, the first letter up there is B. But it's really a 13. In the year 2013, we're going to raise $13 million from this congregation to pay the church off. That's kind of our bottom line, not top line, but that's our bottom line goal. And in order for that to happen, everybody's got to get involved. A lot of people have concepts. Well, I can give 50 or I can give 100. I really don't have anything to give at all. Let's talk about it just for a moment. You would be surprised at how little it costs to give a lot. Let me say that again. You would be shocked at how little it costs to give a lot. Wait a minute, you didn't get that. Let me say it again. You would be surprised, shocked, at how little it costs to give a lot. For an example, listen to this. There's 7,500 giving units in this church. That means last year they sent out 7,500 at the end of the year tax statements for you to write off on how much you gave. If you received one of those, you're a giving unit. A giving unit is somebody who has given. It's a family. It means that one person, if they're single, or maybe a husband, wife, and 14 kids, doesn't matter. That's a giving unit, a family. Whatever the family is, there's 7,500. Now stop thinking about this. Our goal is 13 million. That's a lot of money. But did you know that if everybody tithe, just tithe for three years, now stop thinking about that. Then God say, test me, try me, see if I will not open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing on you, if I will not devour the, uh, if I will not uh, stop the devourer for your sake. It, it, it did it not say I'll make you famous in what the blessings are that the world will recognize who you are. All you have to do is test God in your tithe. But listen to this, listen to this. Let's say that 7,500 giving units, right, uh, they have an average family income of 35,000 a year. They make $35,000 a year. That's all they make. 35 husband and wife work, kids work, everybody contributes whatever they got. $35,000 a year income. And they tithe on the 35,000. Can anybody tell me what the tithe is on a 35,000? Anybody know? Well, how much? 3,005. How much? 3,000 10%. $3,500. So if everybody just gave from that tithe $3,500, do you know how much we would have? We would have almost $80 million. That's bizarre. $80 million. Well, let's take it down because there's a lot of interesting thoughts that go on right here. Remember, we're talking about equal sacrifice because there's a lot of people that can sacrifice a lot and give a lot because they feel it. And there's a lot of people that can sacrifice a small amount like the woman with the widow's might. Let's talk about this just for a moment. Did you know that if your family giving unit gave simply, listen to this, um, about a $1.85 a day, around $2 a day, you would have somewhere in the neighborhood of everything, we would have $13 million. And, and, and did you know that it's so bizarre that if everybody in the church gave a dollar a day, and we would have $25 million in one year, a dollar a day. I mean, it's like nuts if you stop and think about this. Somewhere you can find something to do. Let me give you an illustration of that. It's really fun. We ran an experiment two months ago with 60 kids in our children's church. We asked 60 kids. We gave them $1. And we asked them to take the dollar and multiply the dollar over the next 30 days. Really kind of a cool idea. They said, how do we do that? They suggested, why don't you go buy one dollar mix of brownies. Cook them up, sell the brownies, whatever the profit is, go buy more, and then take it and develop it. One little girl came to me in the last service and she says, I'm part of that, and I brought $92 in on my one dollar. 
Now, wait a minute, hold on. That way, and then another little boy last service said, I brought $76 in. Did you know that out of the 60 kids, 43 of them participated, 13 of them, uh, excuse me, 47 of them participated, 13 said, I'm not going to do anything. Now, watch this. Here's the fascinating part. In this church service right now, there's those of you that'll do nothing. And can I say how sad that is? Here's why. Because you have this greatest opportunity to open up the doors of heaven and stand someday before God and say, my gold, silver, and precious stones, as you look at me, is I paid off a church who dealt in the eternal souls of men by the eternal word of God. And you can't find a church that does better than that. Are you listening to me? And you can stand before God and make a statement like that, man. I'm telling you, that'll be to your credit. You have an opportunity to open up your heart. You have an opportunity to get blessed. And yet, there's still those of you that are in this room that are going to do nothing. Now, let's just talk about it. Did you know those kids that did participate, the 47? They had $1 to start with. I think it was 30 days or 45 days, something like that, um, that they were going to, to raise the money. Do you know what they did with that $1? Next week, they're bringing us a check for $2,500. So here we are adults and we say, here we are adults and we say, I don't have anything. I can't do anything. Uh, I, I can't make it work. I can't really work at this. I, you know, I don't have anything to give. If God gave me something, then I'd give it. It doesn't work that way. You know it. And here are the children that took $1 and turned it into $2,500. There is no excuse whatsoever for any of us to not get involved and do something. Luke, come here just for a moment. I want you to hear some statistics that are really kind of fun. And uh, so, Pastor Luke, share with me some of those, those figures that you shared with us earlier. So some of the things that I like to just do numbers. I, I just I like to figure things out. And uh, these are just illustrative examples, okay? Uh, please understand that if you've taken this book uh, that we've handed out to everybody, and if you've read through it or if you look through it, you'll see in this on several occasions there's a statement in here, and this is truly what we believe, that it's not about equal giving, but it's about equal sacrifice because not everybody relates to the same thing. Not everybody spends the same way. Not everybody does the same things. Not everybody's at the same level. So clearly it's about equal sacrifice or equal uh, what it comes out from the heart. But let me just give you some thoughts, some ideas as a starting point. For me, when I was uh, thinking about $13 million, I was thinking, man, it's a big number. That's a big number to me. So I started thinking about it, and I started to do the calculations of the, of the adults on a weekend service. So just the adults, not including the Children, not including the youth, not including Iglesia La Roca, just the adults in this sanctuary on the weekend services, okay? And I thought, all right, let's start to do that. So I, I divided that about 8,000 adults. Not Sunday night. Not Sunday night, just not, not Sunday night, Friday not Wednesday night. night, not Friday night, just Saturday morning, Sunday morning, uh, three services. So I divided that by, by about 8,000 adults, 8, adults into 13 million. That's a dollar fifty, a dollar fifty a day uh, for three years. Now, I, would, I like to do things that equate to me. So $1.50 a day. My wife, I love her. She's so beautiful on the front row. I love you, Mama. Happy Mother's Day. My wife <laughs> loves soda. She, she loves it. Every time we go somewhere to eat, she drinks a soda. She gets a soda, and, and like we'll go somewhere just right from our house, and we'll go right back to our house and bring our food home, and she gets a soda there. And I'm like, babe, we had soda at home. And so I started thinking about it. So I started paying attention to what soda costs. Some places it's 99 cents. Some places it was $2.25. So the average price of a soda is $1.67 or so. Let's just round down to $1.50 to make it easy. So here's a thought. 8,000 adults. You cut out soda uh, for, for, for three years. Now, that's $13 million just in soda that we would save if we cut out soda. But here's the best part about that. They say that the average American, if they cut out soda in their lives, will lose 10 pounds. Now, you take 8,000 adults and they lose 10 pounds, that's 80,000 pounds yeah, a year, which means to you and me that your car tires aren't going to run out as fast, your gas mileage is going to get better, we won't have to replace all the carpet here in the church and the grass out in the corner courtyard because we're all going to be lighter anyways. But that was just $1.50 a day. Now, 
truly, some of you I know, like myself included, don't drink soda every day. But $1.50 a day is a great place to start thinking about how can I, and that was all it was for me, is how can I relate to my life? What can I start to do to give into this process? And I promise you, you can find it. You can get there. I just met with a guy yesterday, and we were going over his budget. He just graduated from college, and we're trying to figure out where he's got. He got nothing. And we, we sat down and looked at it, and he says, this is what I'm going to do. And we mapped it out and figured out so that he could be a part of this, and he can make a substantial gift. You can get involved. And at the end of this process, I promise you're going to say one of two things. You're going to say, I'm glad I got involved, or I wish I would have gotten involved. Pastor Jim. You know, the neat thing about that, thanks, Pastor. The neat, let's put that card back up. The commitment card, again, uh, is going to show you something. Can you guys in the back room just put the commitment card back up, please? Uh, the commitment card is you're going to fill out the three-year commitment. What can God do for three years? If you were just given a dollar a day, I mean a dollar a day, and you just take it times a thousand because there's over a thousand days in three years, but it took you that time, that would be a thousand. I mean, if you could give a, a, a dollar and a half a day, that would be well over $1,500, $1,600. If you can give, this is where I think we ought to all do, is give a couple bucks a day or two and a half bucks, two and a quarter bucks, then we're at $3,000 per giving family unit. If we can get each one of the 7,500 giving family units to believe God, stretch, sacrifice like the woman or the woman's might, listen to these words, and get in there and make a commitment of $3,000, we would have over $21 million we could build La Roca, a new sanctuary, and our children's church immediately down at the end of the courtyard and buy more spice around for parking in this place. I, come on, somebody. Just by a couple of dollars a day? See, what we don't think is we don't see it in terms like that. And yet this place is a valuable and worthwhile place. I want you to watch the overhead screens for this testimony and listen to the life of this member of our church talk to you. Daniel and I were asked to leave from the house that we were renting. We had four kids. We had nowhere to go. We kept trying to find places to rent and nobody would rent to us. In a sense, we were homeless. And our friends um, from The Rock here, they said they had a 25-foot trailer and they offered it to us. They had an, a vacant lot next to their house and so they said that we could stay there for as long as we needed to. The first campaign, when we were getting ready to build our church, but I remember we pledged this outrageous amount to us. It might as well have been a million dollars. And I told the Lord, I'm gonna trust you. I don't know how we're gonna fulfill it, but I'm gonna trust you. We sacrificed and we gave. And as we gave, God restored a lot of things like our credit. We were able to buy a house during that time. So we bought our first house during the first pledge. God was faithful to his promises. God restored Daniel to a position that he had had before and he was working six days a week. He was receiving full benefits. He was getting bonuses. I challenged God to come through for that amount, and he was faithful. He did come through. We made that, that we fulfilled that pledge. If I think about The Rock, it's been everything for me. The people here, the ministries, they've, they feed thousands of people. Us, at one time, we were there in those food lines when we were homeless. We had, didn't have food to feed our kids, and we stood in those lines to get food. This place does awesome, amazing things for people, hurting people. I, I love this church. God is so here, and you can tell. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. Let's talk just for a moment, and then I'll let you go. Listen closely to what I'm going to say to you. You know darn well you do not want to go to hell. You know darn well you want to go to heaven. But I want you to know something. Unless you do things God's way, you can't get to heaven. Oh, you didn't hear me. Unless you do things God's way, 
you can't get to heaven. In other words, what I'm saying, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except by me. In other words, you can't get to heaven your way, my way, or some well-meaning church committee's way. Now listen closely. You can, if you want to go to heaven, hear me, hear me. You cannot get to heaven because you're a good person. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you get to go to heaven because you're good. You cannot get to heaven because you say you love God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you love God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you get to go to heaven because your mom and dad told you you're a Christian. You know, took you to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class. Took you, you know, had you christened or baptized as a baby. Nowhere. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you. You're not going to go to heaven because you go to church once in a while. And you're really not against God. You know, you know, you really do believe there's a God. And you think you're going to go to heaven. Nope, you're not going to make it. There's only one way to heaven. And Jesus tells us in John the third chapter. He says, you must be born again. Now, a lot of people at 10 American Church don't know what born again means, but I'll tell you what it means. Listen, listen, listen. Born again means this, that you have given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been. Listen, listen. It always will be all or nothing. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to stop messing around, tell you like it really is, and stop playing church in your life, playing games with you. It's all or nothing. Last book in the Bible, a book of Revelation, Jesus speaking, he says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? People that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all, and they're gonna get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Wow. What's lukewarm then? Here's lukewarm. See if it fits. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know, you're not against God, but watch this. You're not wholehearted for God. You know, God is just something in your life like everything else. Until he has made everything, he won't even be something. you got to make him everything by giving him all of your heart, by giving him all of your life. And today, I love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough to tell you the truth. It's time to stop messing with God and give him all of your heart, give him all of your life. And here you are today in a safe, friendly place. We've sung, we've clapped, we laughed, we've heard the word of God. You are great listening. You know God spoke to you today about where you're at. Now listen to this, listen to this. You can walk out of here and do nothing about your future, or you can give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. It is your call, your choice. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do this? How do I give God all of my heart? How do I give God all of my life? Let's do it God's way, okay? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. So that means in a moment, I'm a man, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, and I'll see your hand go up. And when I see your hand go up, guess what? What you're saying is, uh, I don't want to have Jesus in my head like most Americans, because I already know, and so do you, that you know who Jesus is. But it's not about what you have in your head. It's all about what you've done with your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. I'll go one, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hand on this pulpit. It'll sound loud, but listen to this. It'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll go bang. When you hear that sound, bang, your hand goes up all over this place. And what you're saying by the raising of your hand back in the family rooms, in the foyer by television, wherever you're at, where, down at the Love Rock Cafe, down the, uh, if you're listening to my voice, out at the courtyard right now, I'm speaking to you all across this auditorium. Wherever you're at, and you hear my voice, you get your hand up and then put it right back down. I'll see it, and you can put your hand down. Why do I want to do that? Because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. He says, I'll confess you as mine before the Father. Who should raise her hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, maybe I have, maybe I haven't, I'm not sure if I have or not, guess what? Make sure today is your day. I'm counting to three. I've done my job. You say, Pastor, wait a minute, wait a minute, Pastor. You want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. You might be. Get over it. 
It's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Come on, today is your day of salvation. Are you ready? Here it is. Are you ready? Here it is. I'm going to count. Pop my hands. You get your hand up all over this place. Ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Thank you. God bless you back there. Anybody else on this side? Where? Eleven. Thank you. Right there. There's twelve. Thank you. Back here. There's thirteen. There's fourteen. There's fifteen. God bless you. Anybody back here? Sixteen. Thank you. There's seventeen. There's eighteen back there. Up on top. There's nineteen. There's somebody. They're saying back over here. Nineteen. There's twenty back here. Thank you. God bless you. Twenty-one. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 22 back over on this side somewhere. God bless you. They're all pointing in that direction. I can't see which one it is, but that's okay. God does. Anybody in the family rooms? There's 21, 22. Thank you. Anybody else? There's another one. 23. Got you right there. Okay, cool. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 23 wise people. I tell you, if you had any spiritual insight... You don't know what just went on before your eyes. Before your eyes. Nobody talks about giving money and 23 people get saved unless there's the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. Come on. You've got to be kidding me. Did you see that? My goodness. Now listen closely, all 23 of you, I want you to get a hold of your goat fur sweater Bible friend, get your stuff, come from the family rooms, come from the foyer, wherever you're at in this place, wherever you are, if you raised your hand and you're serious about God, or if you should have raised your hand but you didn't, you can come too. Get your stuff, no one leaves during this period of time. Get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Because I surrender Come on, come on home, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on home. I surrender all. Come on, you can sing it with us. Oh, and I surrender all. Come on, you can sing too. Go ahead. And I surrender. Come on, sing that again. I surrender all. Well, thank God you guys have all come. I'm excited about you coming. I want you to look to your left. Look at this guy waving at you. His name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. Listen, he'll do three things. Pray with you, give you some free information, tell you about a program we have to help you get strong in Jesus. We want you to get strong. We want you just to go to heaven. We want you to be healthy and strong while you're here, helping other people to get to heaven too. Let us help you get strong. So it only takes a few moments. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over that way. Come on. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord 
and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.